morning I'm with my friend Rob Brooks. Rob has the most interesting job in the world. He is an evolutionary biologist who studies the evolutionary consequences of sex. He leads the sex lab at the University of New South Wales here in Sydney, where he and his team research topics like the evolution of mate choice, the costs of being attractive, sexual conflict, the reason animals age, and the links between sex, diet, obesity and death. In 2012, his book Sex, Genes and Rock and Roll, How Evolution Has Shaped the Modern World was published. And his second book, Artificial Intimacy, Virtual Friends, Digital Lovers and Algorithmic Matchmakers was published in 2021. Rob has also written three fascinating essays for Quillette, which you can read on our website. So Rob, we're going through an AI revolution and lately I've heard so much talk about AI girlfriends, but no talk about AI boyfriends. Could you tell us a little bit about AI girlfriends and why they seem to be far more popular than AI boyfriends? Huge question, really important question. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll begin with AI girlfriends, mm -hmm. with the familiar technique, technology, sorry, because um, you know we know what that looks like. Uh, and basically, at the moment, there's this proliferation of chatbots that have learned, uh, firstly, in a sort of large language model, um, like the ones that we're all using now. Um, and they've also learned from a specific person. So a great example is Karen Marjorie. Uh, she's Karen AI now. She was a Snapchat girlfriend mm. um, in that she would... Um, have conversations with men, mostly young men, as I understand it, um, that went range from the sort of banal to quite sexy time kind of conversations. Uh, and the, th via Snapchat, somehow they would um, charge the the clients, the, the wow. men. Okay. Um, and so she was chatting with hundreds and hundreds of men making, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month, a very lucrative business model. Uh, um, supplemented with YouTube, where uh, YouTube, she would cut YouTube videos of, you know, advice she has for people, things that she said to people, some of the texts. Was this a real cetera. woman? Or? A real woman. Her wow. name is Karen Marjorie. Yeah. And she and her company that mm -hmm. um, has uh, developed the, the right kind of technology mm -hmm. um, recognized that, you know, a lot of what she was doing was fairly routine um, and was something that could easily be handed over to a a sophisticated, you know, 2023 style chatbot. Okay. And so she took all her videos of YouTube and um, the algorithm learned her, learned the kinds of ways that she tends to respond and react um, and the things she kind of tends to say. Mm. And, um, and now it's available. It's just been available for a couple of months and she's making, you know, substantially more money because, of course, being cloned like that allows her to, you know, freeze up her time and allows her to, um, you know, benefit from uh, what the algorithms learned in the past mm. by basically, you know, cloning her activity. So yeah. it's proved to be an incredibly lucrative uh, model. There are um, all manner of other AI girlfriend type of situations. You can have a relationship with an AI porn star. So there's a famous porn star called Brandy Love, mm -hmm. who's an interesting I agitator. I might be familiar with her work, yes. Because she's, <laughs> she's hyper-conservative. Is she? Yeah, yeah. She, um, so you can, well. you can sign on to chat with her, um, you know, about, you know, you know, the MILF goddess. Okay. Or about sophisticated conversations about conservative politics, mm. uh, conservative wow. American politics, which is interesting because mm. now and again she turns up to American conservative events um, and then gets you know sent away because there are children present and oh. you know you can't be part of this, etc. That's et a bit sad, so, actually. That's amazing the different configurations people's politics yeah. can take on. Mm. So here we have a situation where. Um, all of a sudden, there's this explosion of interest. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like what happened during the pandemic with OnlyFans, mm. in which people would, you know, make video, video content, um, chat directly, you know, upsell to to particularly, you know, um, compelling videos, I suppose. And, you know, um, sex work took on this remote dimension. Mm. Um and it's a similar kind of revolution is taking place, I guess, with a few companies and a few influencers making a tremendous amount of money and having a tremendous amount of influence. Mm. And the question there is, you know, why? Why are there no boyfriends? Well, mm. there are not none. Um, but the immediate kind of 
argument that comes up if we, I were to talk about this um, at the university or, or you know, um, at, at a public venue and, and give a public talk and, and uh, discuss this, the immediate sort of um, suggestion that people have is, well, these things are designed by, you know, 20-something dude bros who live in their parents' basement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they're making the kind of content that suits them. And, you know, that's a fairly cynical take um, because, firstly, the people who are making these technologies are making a mint of money. Um, and they're probably living whatever their, you know, 20 something fantasy is, um, if they have any time, mm -hmm. because cloning people takes time. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's, it's partly true, I think, in that, you know, the, some of the entrepreneurial souls who figured out that you can do this have gone, what's the first thing we can do with this? I know, let's clone a porn star. Yeah. Um, so there's, a, there's an aspect of that, absolutely. Uh, but at the same time, there's a market for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've heard you on the podcast talking mm -hmm. about mating markets and talking mm -hmm. about, you know, mating markets are odd because, you know, talking about heterosexual mating markets, women and men are both suppliers and demanders. Mm -hmm. But the thing that tends to give human mating markets shape is that there are almost always fewer women who are available and fertile and interested um, and visible in order to, you know, take part in the mating market. Mm. Even though the sex ratio might have the same number of, of women and men, there's always a restricted supply of right. women. Right. So it sort of, would you say it centers around women? Like women are the core of, well, I guess it's two, it takes two to tango. But It does take two to tango. And more influential in that um, economy? Well, you know, women's consent has mm. a value. Mm. Um, whereas men's consent doesn't have the same kind of value mm. under most circumstances. Now, there are odd places in the mating market, like mm -hmm. right up the top end of incredibly wealthy, among incredibly wealthy people, in which it is the men who are in demand mm -hmm. and the women, the daughters of wealthy families, mm -hmm. the women who make mm -hmm. big incomes themselves, mm -hmm. who are experiencing less demand for from the kinds of people that they would mm -hmm. be interested in mm -hmm. um, than, than their brothers, their mm -hmm colleagues, etc. So, you know, it's mating markets aren't always like mm -hmm. that, but the dominant, you know, the the, the middle of the mating market where mm -hmm. most of the action is happening mm -hmm. tends to be a female dominated mating market in yeah. that women, you know, the thing that needs to happen in order for this to go ahead mm -hmm. is for the woman to be interested. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that, uh, you know, if there are other things that you can do to gain some kind of um, sexual stimulation to simulate being in a relationship, um, and etc. Mm -hmm. Then there's likely to be a bigger market among men, just as mm. there's a bigger market among men for heterosexual sex right. work. Doesn't that mean it's taking power away from women if we can be replaced by an AI girlfriend, but men can't necessarily be replaced by an AI boyfriend? Seems like there's a bit of an imbalance. It, it worries me a little bit. Yeah, I think, and rightly so, I mm. think it should worry you. I think it should worry uh, people, you know, but both women and men for important reasons. Um, I, I, the, the really important thing is how, what's the business model? Mm. Because if the business model is one in which someone like Karen Marjorie is able to clone herself and benefit from her own labors and her own persona, then, you know, in a way, all power to her. Just yeah. like in pornography, the highest paid stars mm -hmm. are women, mm -hmm. um, certainly in heterosexual porn. Mm -hmm. Okay, So um, if, if those are the people who are profiting, then that's awesome. Yeah, if um, the profits go to them. Yeah. Mm. But if the profits are largely going to the companies mm. that make the technology mm -hmm. um, or entirely going to the um, companies that make the technology, then we've got a re very serious problem. Mm. Um, and you do have a serious problem because it is the kind of market in which men will come in with sharp elbows mm -hmm. and often, you know, squeeze women out of the market mm -hmm. in very deliberate kinds of ways. And so the potential is there for, you know, one of the ways in which women have a structural advantage, which is the capacity to leverage their looks and attractiveness and their savvy in dealing mm -hmm. with intersexual relations mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, make some money out of it and gain some power from it, mm -hmm. um, that is then being usurped by 
the people who own the technology. It's the same thing with, you know, sex robots. If sex robots are, you know, largely catch on for heterosexual men mm. wanting sort of gynoid, mm -hmm. you know, feminine-like robots, um, but those robots are all made by companies, mm -hmm. uh, then you've really taken away um, a really important form of mm -hmm. work that mm -hmm. women have, which is mm. sex work. Mm -hmm. which has historically been a way in which people have been able to achieve mm -hmm. upward mobility mm -hmm. and get themselves out of bad situations mm -hmm. throughout That's history. Um, and if that market's mm -hmm. under cart, mm -hmm. you know, I think that I think that the downside of mm -hmm. that is considerable. What about for women who aren't sex workers but who are being whose value is decreasing because men simply don't feel a need to have literal female companionship because they can supplement it or achieve it through artificial female companionship. There's going to be more single women, women who want a man, who want to have a family, but can't achieve it and can't have it replaced by an artificial man. Yeah. I think mm. that's also huge. Mm. And I think in a way that's going to affect far more individuals than mm. any of the things I've spoken about. Um, because you know, the, women experience lower demand, it means that they are going to be able to drive not as good a bargain. They won't mm. be able to achieve any kind of social mobility or even social parity. Mm -hmm. They'll end up, if they want to have kids, having to pair with a man who's actually, you know, a, a bit of a lead weight, mm. potentially. Uh, he, he doesn't bring as much into the household. He maybe consumes more than he brings in. Mm. Um, you know, there's emotional labor involved, et cetera, mm. et cetera. So, I mean, the thing is that these kinds of market dynamics have always happened. Mm -hmm. This is a particularly dramatic moment because there's so many technological and legal kind of things happening mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, but it's something that we've always had to negotiate, you mm -hmm. know. Men would say, including the people who sort of advocate for the rights of those men who are left behind in mm -hmm. the mating market, they would say, well, you know, um, closing, narrowing pay gaps has resulted in a, um, a, a mating market that no longer suits a vast majority of men. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and you go, uh, how sympathetic do you want to be with that? Mm. In the 1950s, you basically had to get out of bed and go to work in the morning as mm. a man in order to have something to offer in a relationship. Mm. Whereas nowadays with, you know, all of the amazing things that have happened and really good things that have happened in terms of narrowing pay gaps, narrowing gaps mm. in employment and education, etc., um, you have a, a, a situation in which it's not that easy to, mm. to, to get married and find somebody desirable that mm -hmm. you want to be with, mm -hmm. etc. And men have to have a little look at that and go, well, what's it always been like for women? Right. We've had to negotiate, you know, on one hand, how personable he is and mm -hmm. how many, you know, what he brings to the relationship in terms of his other skills, as mm -hmm. well as this question of how am mm -hmm. I going to feed my family and mm -hmm. achieve some kind of social mobility. So would you argue that it's a woman's market right now? I think it's historically been a women's market, mm -hmm. actually. I think, I think that many of the things that conservatives sort of gravitate towards impulsively, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps without necessarily following this kind of logic, mm -hmm. many of those things have tended to favor women in mating markets. Interesting. They've cost women in other areas, like mm. in labor markets and in rights um, and mm. in the way in which people are treated. Um, mm. But in terms of mating markets, basically, if you have you know men competing intensely with one another in order to get, you know, the good jobs, in order to get the money, in order and, and as a result of that, that gives them some kind of an advantage mm -hmm. in the mating market, especially when you have a situation in which not a lot of men are dying in warfare mm. in sort of Western peaceable countries, mm -hmm. countries currently at peace. Um, you So you don't have a sex ratio sort of biasing th things towards um, there being lots of women and mm -hmm. few men. Under those kinds of circumstances, um, the mating market tends to skew towards women. Women have more power in the mating market. Mm. So you get a situation now that takes some men out of the mating market mm -hmm. um, the way that maybe conflict used to do mm. because they're now simply happy to entertain themselves mm. with pornography and with AI girlfriends and with AI virtual reality pornography and all mm. the things that are coming down. Mm -hmm. um, you have a surplus of women who are still like, yeah, the AI boyfriends aren't really doing it mm. for me and I'd like mm. to have kids mm -hmm. and I'd like to have kids with a partner who's somewhat engaged. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's 
disempowering women on the mating market. Yeah. That's and I'm not going like. to say it should be like this or it should be like that mm. because I think there are, you know, tremendous arguments to be made in every direction. Mm. Um, I'm certainly not going to make the arguments that, you know, um, moves towards equality of opportunity mm-hmm. and narrowed pay gaps and mm-hmm. getting rid of all mm. the, the stupid stuff mm-hmm. um, are, are bad things at all. Mm-hmm. Not at all. Mm. Um, but I think that, you know, we have to also recognize that what happens is not, you know, in, when people are looking for mates, is not just, you know, did you go to the right place or go on the right app and meet the one? Mm. But, you know, how many ones were out there in the iceberg holding up the one that you chose? Interesting. Speaking about dating apps, there's been a lot of discourse lately that um, people should be settling more. Have you heard a little bit about this? Yeah, a a little bit, but Mm -hmm. give me your impressions because I am interested. Well, just that like people are getting married later in the West. Um, We're having less kids. Uh, I think this era of like women being more in control like is – um, it obviously feels good in the short term because we, we feel like we have so many mates with dating apps. We can just swipe, swipe, swipe. There's, you know, infinite men. That's what it feels like, at least when you're young. Um, but that's resulting in women thinking the grass is always greener. And in the end, you know, perhaps ending up um, without a husband, without kids, because we've never settled. Yes. Yeah. Like, are you concerned about the birth rate or like the marriage rate or? Neither the birth rate nor the marriage rate really okay. concern me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I I understand why economists are hung up on birth rates. Mm-hmm. I understand why environmentalists are hung up on birth mm-hmm. rates, rates in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. And, you know, quite honestly, I think it, uh, stasis would be awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll take a bet each way and, and mm-hmm. go for stasis mm-hmm. in that regard. Um, I, I really don't care about marriage rates. Mm-hmm. You know, marriage, as far as I'm concerned, is one form of contract mm. and you, you figure out what your contract is. Don't get the state or the church or your parents to, you know, enforce what kind of contract you get involved mm-hmm. in. But, you know, people's happiness and people's well-being, mm. I think, is something that really matters. Mm-hmm. And I think that things that change mating markets change people's happiness and they change mm-hmm. well-being and they change for different groups at different times so the idea that you've just spoken about mm-hmm. that there seem to be endless opportunities because suddenly you know you're no longer constrained by um you know you have to go to places to mm-hmm. meet people you know mm-hmm. when i was young mm-hmm. we laughed at the newspaper personals that was mm-hmm. our tiktok because <laughs> we didn't have the internet yeah um, and we, we would, would laugh at, you know, SWMs with GSOH, mm-hmm. et cetera. Mm-hmm. But um, we had to go to parties, mm. which was fun mm. um, and, and, and fine. But you mm. could only meet, you know, 10 new people in a weekend of whom, mm. you know, one was single and maybe mm. one in 10 was attractive to you, mm-hmm. et cetera. And so, yeah, you didn't have that infinite choice mm-hmm. unless you were – you know, a rock and roll star or whatever, yeah. um, which is the fantasy. Yeah. Now we have the situation where we can scroll through mm. a million people. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's all you're doing really is you're looking into into a crowd. Mm. And people have always had to optimize this question of how long do you search mm. before you settle? Mm-hmm. And by what algorithm do you settle? And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, statisticians have obsessed over this question from a purely statistical point of view for a long period of time. Mm. And so... You know, I don't think it's worth lamenting, um, you know, people aren't settling Mm -hmm. soon enough because that's an individual and personal decision. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a dearth of really good advice Mm -hmm. about how to settle, Mm -hmm. how to arrive at your decision. And Um, do you think that advice would be different for men and women? Absolutely. Mm. Because the the mating market looks different to mm-hmm. to women and men, mm. you know, your normal average man has to swipe, you know, get RSI swiping in order to make a match, yeah. and your average w- looking woman mm-hmm. doesn't have that same mm-hmm. problem, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, let's not trouble ourselves with up at the top end of the attractiveness part of the mm-hmm. mating market because, um, you know, that's that's obviously somewhere people want to be, but most mm-hmm. of them aren't mm. because it is relative. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think that the current generation of matchmaking apps 
are just, you know, they bring the crowd to you, that you can scan the crowd, but you still have to go out into the crowd and start a conversation and meet them. Hmm. Um, and that part is still incredibly laborious. Yes. So <laughs> hmm. I, I think that the next generation of matchmaking apps are going to have to figure out what is it that makes a match turn into a, you know, something more substantial. Yeah. A marriage, a family, or even just even just you know um, a, a, an encounter. You know, okay. yeah. what 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 is the criterion that goes from you know seeing each other on an app to like making out for the first time? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a you know that's something that those apps aren't any good at, mm-hmm. and I think they aren't any good at it because they're basing it on information that users provide. Mm-hmm. But you know, we don't you know if you think of somebody that you've met. And you you go back to just before you met them and you mm. say, is that the person that I imagined? Mm. Very few of us can go, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I was looking for. Yeah, exactly. So this is, mm-hmm. a, this is a job for machine learning, though, yeah. because it is the kind of thing that if you get the right data, mm. incidentally, probably from all the stuff that you haven't told them, mm-hmm. you might have a better chance of finding chemistry. And the person who does that mm. is going to be very rich. Maybe it's you. No, <laughs> it might be you. <laughs> I haven't. I have neither the skills nor the inclination. Hmm. Um, do we know if people are having less sex? That's my understanding mm. as well. Is that mm. teens are are doing fewer, far fewer of the fun and dangerous things that mm-hmm. they used to do and mm-hmm. have done since at least the 1950s, mm-hmm. probably always. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're drinking less, mm-hmm. they're doing fewer drugs, mm. they're um, doing fewer stupid risk-taking things, mm-hmm. and they're definitely having less sex and having it later, mm. etc. And you have to go, What's you know? what are the reasons for mm-hmm. that? I think that one of the reasons for that would appear to be that they are more distracted by other things. Mm-hmm. And as a result, they're socializing at a distance and staying home, even mm-hmm. though they still go out a mm-hmm. lot. It's not that their entire social life isn't, you know, doesn't happen when you walk out of the mm-hmm. door of home. Mm-hmm. And we, we talk about incels a lot, and I know you've written about incels for Quillette as well. Um, Seems like maybe we talk about them a little bit less than we did a few years ago. Um, and I wonder if because young men aren't going out so much and they're spending more time at home and maybe feeling, you know, getting their fix from online porn or artificial intimacy, there's they're not engaging in behavior that would be seen as like violent or aggressive towards women. Um do do you know if the rate of what in seldom or whatever it's called has that changed like post covid what's happening with in cells at the moment a couple of answers to that mm-hmm. one is that it's very hard to track in cells mm. um and to to have some kind of comparison because you know there are folks because of the, the so first of all in cells do heinous things in mm-hmm. real life mm-hmm. um occasionally mm-hmm. every now and again right there are some very well publicized mm-hmm. incidents mm-hmm. and they have uh, you know continued at a reasonably steady rate um so as a result they have a, a, a deservedly bad name mm-hmm. some of the things they talk about on their forums are mm-hmm. equally heinous mm-hmm. and look like much the same thing mm-hmm. and so there is a very strong desire from a lot of people to disrupt those conversations mm-hmm to shut them down. The various incel threads on Reddit, for example, Mm -hmm. have been shut down. And so incel forums are incredibly closed, very hard to get into. Sometimes we Mm -hmm. want to study incels Mm -hmm. with a very open-minded attitude, and it's very hard to advertise to them because Mm -hmm. we're not trusted as researchers. No researchers or very few researchers are trusted to go into those spaces. And their discourse is has a language of its own mm-hmm. that is quite cryptic <laughs> unless you know what it is that they're saying, unless mm-hmm. you've been schooled in it. Um, so, you know, and that that evolves. So it's very hard to keep track of it, you know, mm-hmm. um, just like it would be very hard to keep track of a, a, a particular virus mm-hmm. by looking at only at the, you know, DNA sequence for the first version that was mm-hmm. discovered. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, you know, are they doing less stuff? Are they making less, are, are, are they, uh, you know, disturbing mm. the peace mm. uh, more or less or whatever? Mm-hmm. I I don't know. I mean, I had to watch, you know, people that I know getting sucked into this sort of Andrew Tate 
um, okay. black hole mm. last year. Young people, young, young men? people, yeah, mm. yeah, and and sort of arguing on behalf of him in a way that was, you know, um, other young people in, uh, around me got mm. really, you know, quite worked up about it. You mm. know, we discussed this kind of thing in some of my classes, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the appetite is still there for the kinds mm-hmm. of messages that Incel and PUA mm-hmm. and uh, Manosphere kind of dude bros like mm-hmm. Andrew Tate mm-hmm. um, spell out. Mm. Um, and I don't think that that appetite's going anywhere mm-hmm. because I think that that's something that appeals to the problems that young men mm-hmm. face, particularly young men who have, you know, m- maybe don't have all the things going for them that would allow them to easily navigate their mm-hmm. worlds. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's definitely still mm-hmm. around, but mm-hmm. they're not doing as much, I, do, I think, mm-hmm. um, certainly not in relation to the growth of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that a lot of that is that they're distracted. Mm-hmm. So, you mm-hmm. know, we spoke about the downsides for women mm-hmm. of a uh, mating market that's affected by AI girlfriends, mm-hmm. but actually the upsides for women and for men and for children and for everybody of having young men distracted, who are, who are incel vulnerable, shall we say, who mm. are practically incels, whether they mm-hmm. identify with incels or not, mm-hmm. having them distracted by the likes of, you know, um, an online girlfriend mm-hmm. and having some of their, what it is that they're looking for filled Fulfilled, by yeah. that, even if it isn't filled in, in a wholesome way mm. or in a way that's going to be sustainable for them personally, mm-hmm. is an enormous public benefit. And that's something wow. that, you know, those who argue against sex work and argue mm-hmm. against pornography mm-hmm. fail to notice. Mm-hmm. Um, and they may go, well, we need to socialize young men not to want that. Well, mm. you can't socialize. I don't think it's worth trying to socialize young men to not want sex, sex. or intimacy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that I think that the technology markets can can satisfy mm all sorts of different needs mm. from all sorts of different demographics. Mm-hmm. But servicing that particular demographic, I mm-hmm. think, does a huge public mm. good. And probably does the men, men a bit of good. They can mature a little while they're mm-hmm. stuck in that loophole. Mm. Among lay people who haven't studied evolutionary psychology or biology, what do you think are the main misconceptions or where's the lack of understanding when it comes to um, perhaps sex differences or... Um, gender, you know, interactions, because, you know, I, I had Holly Lawford Smith on the, on the podcast, um, a few weeks ago, and I think you saw it, we got into quite a good discussion about sex differences. And while Holly and I both agree that, um, obviously there's, you know, physical differences, we, uh, we didn't agree. She didn't agree that, um, there were many sex differences above the shoulders. So, yeah, what what do you think about that? It's a very complicated question mm-hmm. to answer. Mm-hmm. And I admire the way that you and Holly mm-hmm. took that on because mm-hmm. I thought that both of you were very nuanced and very open in a way that these conversations seldom are. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I think that, you know, watching Holly's responses to you, she's used to shutting down the, you mm-hmm. know, men are like this and women are like that. Men mm-hmm. are from Mars, women are from mm-hmm. Venus kind of sex differences mm-hmm. stuff, which is an idea that's very compelling to us because we need to navigate this world mm. of women and men, of who we are in relation to who this other half of humanity mm-hmm. is, etc. And so we gravitate to those kinds of ideas um, and of course, as Holly pointed out, mm-hmm. and as as any reasonable sort of um, argument against the mm-hmm. evolutionary psychology view would would point out that you you just don't understand how strong and persistent culture is. Mm-hmm. We all grow up in culture, and culture tends to result in these kinds of solutions that have strong sex differences, and because they're so pervasive, and we feel like we've always felt that way psychologically, we believe that we've always felt in a particular way. We um, we simply can't imagine how strong the effects of culture are, and I've I've heard the expression used the failure of sociological imagination, mm. that you don't you, you you just don't understand how strong culture is, mm-hmm. to which I'm surprised not a lot of people have made the counter argument you just mm. don't understand how strong genes are yeah you know but. I think it would be very disappointing if we got stuck on nature versus nurture because mm-hmm. it's an old, tired, mm-hmm. dead horse. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. we have a nature. Mm-hmm. Some of that nature involves 
genetic differences or mm-hmm. at least differences of one really crucial genetic switch, which is the switch mm-hmm. that says turn into a male body or turn into a female mm-hmm. body, but other ones too. Mm-hmm. So if we acquire sex differences through culture, then there's a couple of very much more interesting questions for me. One is, are certain types of um, expressions of gender easier to learn mm. in a female body than in a male body? And why is that? Could Do you we, give me an example? No, well, I think you spoke in, in your podcast mm-hmm. about, you know, uh, women being more adept at defusing situations verbally, for yes. example. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, you know, when you, you were saying that, I was thinking, well, that, that's... I've never heard that said that that's a, a strongly genetically determined trait, and mm. I don't think it would needs to be. Mm-hmm. But um, are you, you know, is a, a female hormonal profile and a female body and mm. whatever happens to the brain in developing? Mm. Um, and I think it's it's absurd to imagine that you know twenty percent of our body mass is somehow not vulnerable to yeah. developing slightly differently. Yeah. With with that kind of hardware, mm-hmm. is it a little easier t- to learn or a, just a little mm-hmm. more important to learn how to do this this yes. stuff? And so, yes, you know. Um, you, so it is cultural. Well, it, it can be culturally acquired mm. and yet at the same time influenced by genes. Yes. You know, a, a person in a male body mm-hmm. who is perhaps in a, you know, raised in a utopic gender neutral kind of situation, mm-hmm. which of course, you know, mm-hmm. doesn't exist, but mm. people have tried many times, <laughs> mm. um, may not find it as easy mm. to learn those kinds of things, particularly mm. if they're in a big male body mm. who's just used to taking up space, et cetera. Yes. And so they may never acquire that, but had mm-hmm. they been in a small male body, they might have acquired that. Mm. So that's one side of it. Mm-hmm. And the other side is, of course, you know, the sex differences argument is always we can measure sex differences because what our statistical tests do mm-hmm. is they look, you know, we look for significant differences. And most papers, and it's not just in evolutionary psychology, but most papers, you know, you want to have something to say that is actually happening in your data, mm-hmm. not, well, there were, was no effect. So right. in most situations, one thing you know is that there's likely to be a difference on average between males and females. Mm-hmm. And in human psychology, that's mm-hmm. between men and women. And so there are all of these measured sex differences, some of which we went out, you know, researchers went out to look for, to test ideas about, and some of which um, are inadvertent and they came about because that's just how the data fell out. Mm. Um, but those differences on average have massively overlapping distributions. The questions that I think are far more interesting is how do people respond to environments? How do they respond Mm. to culture? And how does that result in sex differences? Mm. So one thing that I think is really compelling is that um, if you look at a bunch of different places with differences in the level of gender equality, Mm -hmm. you would expect from the sort of – we acquire gender and it's and it's entirely culturally determined, et cetera, et cetera, that more equitable countries will tend to mm. have more similar mm-hmm. measures mm-hmm. or n- not necessarily countries. It could just be, mm. you know, local environments mm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. But in fact, the opposite mm. tends to be mm-hmm. true. This is the Nordic paradox, right? The Nordic paradox in the context of, yeah, 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 oh, that's true. Yeah, That the, the Nordic countries have the most, uh, are the most um, equal in terms of gender, but the outcomes are not equal. They're actually... What That's one of those expressions. Mm. And I'm mm. having a feeling that you talked about this after yeah. I stopped listening yeah, yeah. to the podcast. <laughs> but um, there are some very big mm-hmm. e- studies done by economists mm-hmm. who don't care. Mm-hmm. They really, like, they just want to... They're far less invested in mm-hmm. things like sex differences than evolutionary psychologists because mm-hmm. evolutionary psychologists tend to be in a battle against, you know... Um, Everyone. <laughs> well, in particularly, you know, a... Um, sort of particular feminist ideas about how gender is acquired. Yes. And yes. I think that's a really healthy and mm-hmm. important debate to mm-hmm. have because it keeps each other honest or it should keep each other more honest because we should engage with one another more. Yes. Nonetheless, but a bunch of economists have done a bunch of work on how people play these various games like ultimatum games, mm. etc., that are not, you know, immediately gendered in the sense that we think of them as, you know, men need to be able to negotiate like that, mm-hmm. whereas women like this, mm-hmm. etc. Um, and what they found was the more 
equitable a country was, the bigger the difference was. And their argument was, as you move towards gender equity, you're freed from the constraints mm. of making a living, mm -hmm. of just getting by. Mm -hmm. If you're in a highly gender inequitable country, you're also likely to be in a in a less um, economically developed country, et cetera, in a more conflict-ridden country. Unfortunately, mm. that's the way it seems to fall out at the mm -hmm. moment. And as a result of that, um, you basically have to function first as a human being in those kinds of neutral tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't get a chance to express yourself and and so in a way, some sex differences mm. may appear to be a kind of a luxury mm. or at least something that people can afford to express mm. when their That's opportunities aren't as constrained. Interesting. Including as constrained mm -hmm. by their genders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's nothing that settles this mm -hmm. discussion. Yeah. And it will never, ever settle in terms of, well, the evolutionary psychologists were right. Mm. Women, Men are from Mars and women are from mm -hmm. Venus. Not that any evolutionary psychologist worth their salt mm. would ever mm. argue that. Mm. You know, it's very easy to caricature both sides and mm -hmm. both sides do it. Yeah. I see it. I go to an evolution conference and I see them caricaturing, mm -hmm. you know, feminism, even mm -hmm. though some absolute feminist icons are sitting in the audience mm. because they're, you know, feminist psychologists and anthropologists who've mm -hmm. contributed enormous amounts mm -hmm. to the, the feminist project. And similarly, you don't go to a gender conference and uh, or you, you go to a gender conference and you mm -hmm. will hear ridiculously simplistic things said about genes mm. by people who gave up biology in year seven and have no interest whatsoever mm. in genes and how they work. Mm. Well, I guess people don't like seeing inequality do they like most of us would love a world in which you know there's absolutely no um difference of um outcome the feminist concern is that we explain away these differences in outcomes like you know the gender pay gap or that there are more male pilots or more male ceos they they feel like evolutionary psychology just, you know, says, well, men and women are different, so therefore there's going to be different outcomes. Do you think there's a world in which, you know, there, there could be more equality of outcomes? Do you think that's something we should be striving for? Or do you think lay people should understand that there are sex differences and we should just accept them and that these differences create disparate outcomes? It's a, it's a, it, I don't think that we should ever really accept anything on the basis of uh, you know, the science is settled. Men are like this and women are like that. Right. I don't think that at all. Mm -hmm. Because for any trait mm -hmm. that you look at, there are, are women who are well into the male space and men who are well into the women's space. Mm -hmm. And, of course, with the complications of gender mm -hmm. and of gender identity, mm -hmm. um, that's getting way more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's incredibly arrogant to assume that your own discipline has the answers to these questions mm -hmm. that people have squabbled about for as long as we have historic records mm -hmm. in their own form and in the ways in which their society permitted them to squabble about. Mm -hmm. I think it's really useful to, to try and tackle unfairness mm -hmm. um, and you know unnecessary and silly constraints. Mm -hmm. um, and yet at the same time, I think... I think we shouldn't. We should never be slaves to theory, mm. uh, particularly. I think social theories, not necessarily theories from the social sciences, but mm. theories about how social living works. Mm -hmm. You know, they tend to date themselves mm -hmm. because we do move along. You know, if you if you look at what folks were saying in the late '60s about women and men and genes, and you know, they'd only just figured out what a gene was, mm -hmm. um, and yet, if we if we had accepted what people were saying at that time we would have not made the progress that yeah. we've made yeah. and people would not have the opportunities that they have. Mm. So, you know, um, these things tend to expire. I even mm. think of some things, and I probably shouldn't say this, but mm. some of the things I wrote in my book, my mm. first book, mm. just over a, pretty much a decade ago, mm -hmm. um, that I look back on now and go, yeah, not so sure I should have been so confident about mm. that, you know, um, not necessary to do with gender. Yeah. Be people are going to have to read the whole book and buy mm -hmm. the book in order, to, <laughs> in order to find it if Link they really the want to crucify me. Yeah. But, um, yeah, can you mention, like, what... <laughs> it's right at the end of the last <laughs> chapter, but you have to read the whole thing in order to understand right. it. Um, so I, I don't know if this is the case within mm -hmm. the sort of scholarship of gender that mm -hmm. you might have in a gender studies department mm -hmm. because whilst I read, you know, the highlights mm -hmm. and the bits that are accessible mm -hmm. and interpretable to mm -hmm. me, I don't read it with quite the same 
you know, background knowledge or, mm-hmm. or clarity mm-hmm. or in necessarily enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that some of the things that people said, you know, 20, 30, 40 years mm-hmm. ago are likewise, mm. you know, incredibly dated. Can you go into some of the things that you're not as sure of now, the things that you wrote about in your book? Questions about about men's motivation to sort of get to the top Hmm. in scramble competition situations mm-hmm. um, in which, you know, in some fields, I think a lot of the arguments uh, folks have made is that that's a toxic field for women. And so women just self-select themselves out. Mm-hmm. And so you have to be incredibly tough or, you know, um, have a, you know, male-like competitive mindset to compete with men on their own terms kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And that was the predominant e- explanation for certain things. And I went, yeah, but also the payoffs You know, the payoffs are different Um, and, you know, where the payoffs are like being a rock star, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, the payoffs to women of being a rock star, are global fame, you know, money. You look at what Taylor Mm -hmm. Swift's doing right Mm -hmm. now um, in terms of being easily the most influential Mm -hmm. artist on the planet. Mm -hmm. And someone's going to hate me for saying that, too. (laughs) But, you know, and 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 bringing together so many different strands of mm-hmm. performance and marketing in such a layered kind of interesting way. Mm-hmm. I think we've got a Taylor Swift fan. <laughs> I have a daughter who's a Taylor Swift right, fan. Okay. And I've lost days of my life trying to get those <laughs> tickets and so did she. Right. But anyway, um, yeah, you look at what she's, do- she's mm-hmm. doing right now. Um, the returns to her, however, are in terms of financial and influence and immortality mm-hmm. and artistic returns, mm-hmm. all of which apply to men. But, you know... In the 1970s mm. and 80s, there were also returns in terms of, you know, short-term sexual mm-hmm. payoff. That Still I think, to this day, right? Yeah. Mm. Money for nothing and your chicks mm. for free. <laughs> Any other books in the in the works? I, I'm, I've written a paper that should be 2,000 words, and it's about 10,000 words at the moment mm-hmm. on how artificial intelligence is going to influence human evolution. Wow. Um, Big topic. Yeah. Massive. And most of the stuff on, on how AI is going to... Sh- shape human evolution Mm. is you know folks going well for humanity to survive Mm -hmm. we need to adapt because that's Mm. their view of evolution evolution Mm -hmm. doesn't work that way evolution Mm. doesn't care whether or not the species goes extinct Mm. sometimes the things that evolve actually drive the species closer to extinction because they're Mm. stupid (laughs) in terms of a a persistent kind of ecology yeah and similarly in humans i've never known anybody who's ever had sex for the species Mm. Uh, they might have tried to sell that, um, <laughs> but it's a terrible approach to pick up because really, you know, people have sex for much more selfish reasons. And um, and that's what natural selection is really about, is those reasons about you and your lineage. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, whether or not AI drives humanity extinct, mm. I have no idea and you know, I don't really care as long as it's mm-hmm. not within the next 30, 40 years. Yeah. But it's going to do all sorts of tiny little things that are going to add up. Like it's going to cause a lot of human misery yep. along the way. That's wow. worth caring about. Okay. And incidentally, the, mm-hmm. the accumulation of tiny little things over many generations will also eventually come to be something to care about. Wow. That's deep. It's a bit scary. Uh, <laughs> stay away from the tech. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Zoe. It's been great fun. Yeah. Until next time. Cheers. Bye-bye.